we're going to read a thread from my lovely, lovely critter, Doe. Doe wrote a response to ContraPoint's thread. Um, it was actually really funny. Uh, we both were writing. I woke up and saw the thread, and I started writing my little speech or whatever. And then I went downstairs to get breakfast, and Doe, I saw that Doe was also writing a thing. And neither of us even had talked to each other for the day yet. Which is just, I guess that's what it's like when you're both politically active. Anyway, let's read Doe's thread. All right, let's read Doe's thread here, okay? Doe says, this thread seems genuine. I'm going to try to be as honest, I'm going to try as honest a response as possible. Doe says, I don't consider myself an anti-electoralist, but I feel threads like this are directed at people with politics like mine. So I'm going to try and talk about why I have the politics that I do. So like I said, I don't consider myself an anti-electoralist. Why am I responding? On a personal level, my experiences have taught me that formal power isn't always on my side and will take my willingness to treat it on its terms and use that against me. Said another way, I'm responding because my politics is one which doesn't take formal power to be the only operative political subject. Every formal power relies on a great mass of informal relations, informal activity, and informal power even. Take work to rule strikes, also known as malicious compliance, as an example. Their power comes from the inability of formal power to account for and list out all of the local momentary variations in activity. When the rule is followed to the letter, chaos ensues. So if you're not familiar with work to rule strikes, I'm just gonna take a second here to describe them. A work to rule strike is like um, if you worked at Walmart and uh, and Walmart says um, every employee needs to do 20 minutes of stocking uh, every two hours that they're on the floor. And when you're working at the Walmart, because it's so busy and understaffed, uh, people don't really do the stocking. You have like one or two people who do stocking for their whole whole uh, for their whole you know, shift, and then everybody else takes care of customers or works the registers or whatever. But the rules say, you're supposed to do 20 minutes of stocking at the end of, uh, of, of every two hours of work. A work to rule strike would say, okay, then fine. We're going to follow everything in the handbook exactly as it is written. And so people start going, they do, they're like, oh, sorry. I was checking people out at the register. Got to go do my 20 minutes of stocking. And they walk away following the rules, mind you. But now there's a line of angry customers screaming at the manager because the person walked away to go follow that there's that that's like a that's an example that i just kind of made up there are all kinds of examples of this the reality is that of course every single if you've ever worked in retail you know that that there are tons of ways in which people bend and adjust the rules to make sure that your local business makes sense you might have like corporate edicts that say this that and the other thing like say if you work in an area where because of where you work, like maybe there's a big company that's right next to your building, your lunch hour is two hours later than what the co corporation says lunch hour is. So the corporation says, you need to have this many people staffed between these hours, but if you were to follow that rule, you wouldn't have enough people to cover the unique situation in your case. Now, some companies have rules that accommodate that and, and some do not. A work to rule strike is basically done when a corporation is squeezing the workers and won't hear them out, and so they do that. Hopefully that makes sense. It's also stuff, there's all kinds of ways that you can do work to rule strikes, but that's just an example. Okay, so now that that's explained. Doe says, how do we start connecting this to electoralism? Firstly, I have voted in every election that I've been able to vote in. Holy shit, holy shit! B -b 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 Exposed! The doe, oh my god, radical doe, a voter, a vooter, holy shit, what? I've seen a huge amount of people spend hundreds or thousands of hours just promoting a single local candidate who reflects their views only for that candidate to lose. Does this mean we should stop voting? Obviously not. But what does it mean? If dedicating a year of my life to volunteering for and promoting a candidate had zero effect on formal power, what am I supposed to do? As a minority who is directly under attack from reactionary laws, what do I do? We'll return to that question 
We'll return to that question. Let's talk about democratic structures and a tension that exists for leftists about democracy. Mechanistically, democracy is majority rule. But as a progressive ideal, it's everyone has equal say, which implies minority protections. But we're all progressives, leftists, etc. here. We know that our democracies are full of non-democratic mechanisms. We know that some powers have more say than others. From gerrymandering to money in politics, there are material circumstances that relegate the so-called equal say beneath them. By pretending like elections are an equal playing field of ideas and advocacy and pretending that with enough advocacy, enough volunteering, and good enough ideas, any politics can be enacted, one can have one's time and energy sapped away into activities that change nothing. This leads us to another one of the reasons I can't consider myself an electoralist. Formal structures of political power function off of a set of unspoken presuppositions. A politician who can't hope to keep their a politician can't hope to keep their job while hammering against the businesses who fund the state. A politician who is too on the side of workers, environmentalists, minority justice advocates, one who is taking big swings at corporations and mega conglomerates which exploit their workers and perpetuate great harm to local environments, people, wildlife, etc., gets ousted. Some politicians have learned to thread the needle, running on a platform of just enough progressivism or change to get voters voting. But while beholden to the material interests of those corporate entities who are seen as the makers of the economy in any given district. Let's take an example. Climate scientists have, for, some quite, for quite some time now, read decades, been proposing policy that would help counteract the effects we are having on the climate. Each of these proposals has routine, routinely been seen as unfeasible because they go against growth. But these proposals are only unfeasible given a certain set of unspoken presuppositions about, the, about economies and about our formal political structures. The limits can be overcome through a change in the set of presuppositions. So to recap, democracy is equal say, but its structures of power simultaneously value some people's say significantly more than others. Majorities over minorities, colonists over colonized, gerrymandering, money in politics, corporate power. Formal power also can't function without a mass of informalities which give it the substance of life. Those same informalities which make it operant can undermine formal power. So, with that said, when presented with the experience of attempting over and over and over again to get some amount of representation for my own needs and receiving, in return, an onslaught of Christian nationalism attempting to criminalize my very existence, what can I do? As you can see in countries like the UK, labor parties routinely decide that the current targets of reactionary craze are the real problem and shift their politics around attacking those same targets in a hope that it wins them the majority. We've seen some Democrats do the same. What do I do when even a party that once claimed to fight for the rights of all minorities decides that my kind of person doesn't even deserve the limp minority protections that currently exist? The answer is obvious, and it just stares us in the face. You resist. You break the, the law as necessary. You lie. You jam up the mechanisms being used against you. You stop pretending that democracy is an equal playing field of ideas. It isn't. National powers like the federal government will always be able to boast doing the most since their decisions inherently apply across the entire population. But even in the best of legal protections, informal power can undermine those protections. Legalizing gay marriage doesn't mean kids don't get kicked out for being gay anymore. Employee protections against racist or transphobic or homophobic employers doesn't actually mean the workplaces won't discriminate. It just means they'll have to hide it through formalities. Our system of democratic power is fundamentally undemocratic, and even in the best case scenario in which it was truly democratic, as a minority, I still have particular needs that are separate from a majority. The levers of formal power are out of my reach and out of your reach. Since those levers are out of my reach, what can I do? Can I live my life as a political agent? Sorry, I can live my life as a political agent. I can form collectivities with others in which we can carry out greater actions through our collective power. I can undermine bad laws by protecting those who break them. We have all been failing. 
I am not going to write a laundry list of successes of resistance, many of which will never be reported, since they could be acts of illegality and secrecy. But it is through organized, coordinated material pressure that we begin to be a power. Fucking spitting, right? As you can see, Doe and I agree thematically on a lot of things, but we have a different way of looking at it. There are certain points where we're like in 100% agreement, you know, like for example, that um, your, your, your energy and time is limited and can be easily sapped away by ruthless and careless political orgs that claim to be looking out for you, almost like a church claims to be looking out for you and saps away your money and time. Um, we, we are definitely in agreement on that. But there's like, we have slightly different frames of analysis and, and you know, the way, that, the way that, that we both look at it is a slightly different perspective. Doe has a, um, well, Doe has a, Doe has a very, you know, Doe is very, much more influenced by like writers like Deleuze than I am, where like Doe has a more, uh, looks at things more as like connections of various small machines. And I find that very fascinating and interesting. Also, Doe is a lot more restrained <laughs> and diplomatic, I guess, than I am. Um, but yeah, um, that was something also, Doe, Doe reminded me of something that, uh, that I forgot to mention in the, uh, in, 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 in responding to ContraPoints, which I wish that I had mentioned it. Um, it's, I really hate the way that liberals uh, try to claim all of the victories and none of the drawbacks of their favorite candidate. They claim that electoralism got us every decision that Joe Biden makes, which in reality, it doesn't. It just put Joe Biden there, uh, you know, to, in some degree. The machine put Joe Biden there and then Joe Biden made the decisions that he did. The actual connection between the only thing that mattered was putting Joe Biden in power. When, whenever electoralists love to do this, and I hate it, I hate it so much, okay? Um, electoralists love to claim like, oh look, you know, because of electoralism, we got insert like climate bill or anti-discrimination thing. And then you go, okay, yeah, but Joe Biden is also funding a genocide. And they go, well, we didn't, we didn't want that. Well, which one is it? Either it, it's absurd to, to claim that electoralism can claim all responsibility for the good things, but none of the bad. Either electoralism made made Joe Biden uh, uh, made Joe Biden make the decision to um, uh, to pass a climate bill and to do to participate in a genocide, or it didn't do either of those. And the reality is that the electoralism is sort of just a very, very abstract process by which some guy gets put in charge. It's super, I saw tons of this sentiment. Um, ContraPoints kept saying things like um, the, the Civil Rights Act only, like the Civil Rights Act uh, mattered because, uh, oh, I, I mentioned this, uh, the, the whole, the, 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 I did read one of those tweets, but I didn't fully go into it as much as I wanted to. What a mistake, but whatever. Um, ContraPoints mentioned, um, like the civil rights, uh, movement mattering because like a politician said that it mattered and offered an edict and not that the civil rights movement was a bursting forth. It was an enormous amount of people and their allies saying enough is enough and literally stopping it. Like, remember that the civil rights movement required people doing protests that interrupted businesses. They did sit-ins. They would go to a racist business and say, we're coming in whether you like it or not. They were personally changing the paradigm. The, the politicians just did a formal recognition. It's such a twisted lens to be like all of these people who went and sat in in places and disrupted businesses and, and blocked bus lines and all of that. All of those people, it only mattered because a politician said, okie dokie. And I wanted to give a, um, I wanted to give another example, just a, a hypothetical. Imagine there is a small rural town 
that for some reason has an above average amount of gay and trans people, of queer people, we'll say queer people broadly, okay? And that town, uh, all of the queer people in that town make a little community center. Somebody has a house that's, that's got a big rec room and they make a little community center. And those gay people start talking to each other and they go, I want us to host events in the downtown where we can start articulating our presence as a gay community in this small rural town. So they do that. And over the course of five years, the town goes from being fairly discriminatory to uh, being familiar with the gay people who have a party or a, or a get together or a educational whatever, a drag show, whatever, that happens every week. And slowly and surely that town becomes one of the most gay friendly towns in in the area because these because people who may have previously been a little bit discriminatory they meet some gay people they talk to some people they they see that their neighbors are gay they start to and then at after those five years this place has become a safe place for gay people does it only matter when the the governor goes we hereby declare our town rats hole montana is now the happiest place for gay people in all of Montana. Is that what mattered? Or was it the fact that now the town actually became the safest place for gay people? Was it the declaration of the governor of Rats Hole, Montana? Or was it the actions that people took that changed the town? Sure, some, some government recognition is probably great. But what mattered was the town becoming safe by people's actions. You have to make them want to do the laws in the first place. But often it's not the laws that matter. It's changing the world. It's changing the relations that matter. Yes, laws do have an effect, no doubt. But keep in mind that there are places right now in America where if you're a trans person or a black person, even though it's illegal to discriminate against you, you go and live in that town, you will not be able to get a job. Right now, even though there are laws all over the place that say you can't be discriminated against. There are numerous places in America where you go there and it doesn't matter. What matters is people taking the actions to change the paradigm. The law is, is, can only be a recognition of, of the values. The values changing is what matters. The, the relations changing. And people being able to say, you want to live, you want to try and discriminate against us? Fine, we'll get together and we'll push back. The, the Black Panthers are like a perfect example of this. People being racist all over the place, Jim Crow, uh, Jim Crow era laws, and, and not just the laws, but the, the, the laws were against them in the Jim Crow era. And what started to change it was Black Panthers getting together, putting together a lunchroom, all of those people who were being discriminated against coming together and going, all right, your boss is calling you uh, uh, slurs? We'll all show up together. Let's go have a talk with your boss. And then you and your ripped nine buddies go and go, hey, how's it going, buddy? You want to say what you said to me earlier? And then the boss goes, yeah, 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 and never does it again. It was people living in towns where the KKK could beat the shit out of anybody who looked... Uh, who, whose skin looked too dark and they all got together and said you want to beat us the fuck up we'll beat you the fuck up and then all of a sudden it's oh shit whoa let's sit down and have a talk now Stonewall another example uh, cops breaking, uh, 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 cracking down on gay people over and over and over again. And finally, gay people said, enough. If you think you can do this, we'll make a stink. 
and we'll make a stink every time. It'll cost you money and time. So either you stop cracking down on us or we make a stink and you have a bad time. All right, I have another I have another thread that I want to read. Okay? This one is from friend of the show and personal friend, Chariot. Let's read Chariot's thread about this same topic. Chariot says, you may notice that you may notice that the left doesn't want to have power. They want to endlessly critique power. Is true only of leftists who have real principles. It is not true of cult leaders or grifters or authoritarians who take no issue with those power structures. Left-wingers who believe that real justice cannot come from those institutions will naturally resist capture by them. As a critique of the effectiveness of the left, this statement inherently concedes the moral high ground. You might think, well, at a certain point, I'd rather be alive than moral, but with the structural incentives of liberalism, you will be at some point for someone choosing neither. Climate change, for instance, for instance is the result of incentives structurally fundamental to capitalism. At best, liberals can only win every battle and thus stave it off for, for only so long but it will remain a possibility as long as it has the potential to be profitable. The persecution of minorities, for another example, is endemic to liberal civil society. The marginalized exist as a function of the margins created by those systems of power innate within those institutions that we just discussed. I've written about this at length and plan to again soon, but here's the truth. Whatever a socialism or social system that comes after liberal capitalism means, it must not be an affirmation of those institutions. It's not socialism or barbarism, it's socialism or suicide. Fantastic thread. Not, uh, not responding to the, th to the thread but directly, but responding to the sentiments and other such sentiments. Um, this is the whole, this is what I talked about, about, uh, uh, when I mentioned that, um, people have to sell themselves out to become a part of the machine. If you want to rise through the ranks of the democratic party, you have to change careers. You will eventually have a different friend group because you won't be living the same life as the other people around you. You have to change your values. You will have to sacrifice things that you believe in in order to get ahead within the democratic machine. And that gets worse and worse the closer you get to the top. There is only a certain type of person that can rise to the absolute top of these democratic party machines. They are designed to ensure that. The democratic party is designed to make sure that somebody doesn't get into power that makes them lose all of their funding. And it only stops doing that when there's a catastrophe, an unpredictable catastrophe. Joe Biden, for example, having dementia moments. And now they're like, oh shit, we don't know what to do. And we can see they didn't even plan around that because it wasn't even in their mind that that was a possibility. I really like the way the chariot described this. Noble Aristotelian says, Brown versus Board of Education had to be implemented by force, not merely by just saying school integration is the law of the land. Yes, even after the law passed, people had to go and take action because people just, res pe because racists resisted it. Exactly. Somniostatic says, Riverboat Jack thinks that he'll step down still. Um, it's possible. Uh, he said as of just a few hours ago, um, right before I started stream, Joe Biden had just reaffirmed publicly that he won't be stepping down. We'll see. Joe Biden stepping down 
would be the smartest move he could possibly do right now. He is going to lose the election if he tries to continue. Um, even if it's possible, e think of it this way. Even if Joe Biden, on paper, is the best shot against Donald Trump right now, we know it's going to get worse. I have a whole sec section on Biden, so we'll get to that in a minute. We'll talk about Biden in a second. I have another thread that I want to read through, okay? I want to read through Zexizi's thread, okay? Some of you may know uh, Zexizi, a.k.a. Muk. Zexizi is an OG bread tuber. And Zexizi made a, uh, a thread on ContraPoints' thread, a, a response to ContraPoints' thread, and um, I wanted to read it especially because Zexizi has a very different perspective than mine, and I wanted to talk about it. Not very different. Okay, in some ways, yes. Like, Zexizi is, like, uh, uh, Zexizi is very anti-electoralist. Anyway, let's, let's read Zexizi's, uh, let's read Zexizi's thread. Zexizi says, I appreciate that you're honestly asking what alternative exists, but this cannot continue to be framed as vo just voting one more time. The impetus of direct action is recognizing that the Dems are not only ineffective against fascism, but that neoliberalism is what is producing it. Given this, alternative forms of power untied to the Dems is the only option against fascism. If you don't think the left does anything, quote unquote, fighting Trump means making it your responsibility to make them do something. Luckily, there are already things are already more helpful than that, more hopeful, sorry, than that. Direct or radical action, like anything, requires numbers to work, and it's only very recently that there have been significant people aware of it as an option. I don't know if I 100% agree with that, but that's fine. Movements are incremental. We don't get to take over the government first try, but they inspire more people than before. For example, 2020 didn't lead to many direct concessions, but it did set the stage for the recent occupations, which thanks to their more radical politics than, say, Occupy Wall Street, were able to win lots of concessions in defunding Israel. This is a really good point from Zexizi that I think gets, um, gets, under, uh, th gets criminally under, uh, what's the right word, undercredited uh, on the left. Uh, people, I've seen a lot of commentators become very jaded towards uh, all of the George Floyd protests during 2020 as if it didn't fundamentally change the conversation around resistance in modern America. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, police, one of the most entrenched institutions in America, didn't just immediately give up a white flag and get defunded. However, the fact that everyone knows and has been paying attention to, to uh, police brutality is a huge deal. It has completely changed the way that people think about the police. It has completely changed the way that people think about resistance. And I do 100% agree that it set the stage for the student protests um, for Gaza, which were crazy. Even the tactics carried over. You can actually see in real time the development of protest tactics from 2020 that were used again effectively uh, in the school protests. Anyway, let's continue. Now, because of their actions and brutal police retaliation, yet more people are radicalized than before. The reason this all matters is because when, not if, the far right eventually wins, existing movements prepared to take direct action will be the only line of defense left. This is very similar to what I said at the end of my little speech, but worded a little bit differently. The idea basically is, for all the people who are talking about electoralism out there, what happens if Joe Biden loses? What if everybody does the electoralism and he loses? What happens if the Supreme Court maintains its right-wing position, then what? Then you do what everybody else is saying? You should probably just start doing that now. Zexizi says, this is all without even mentioning revolution. Even if that's still an impossibility to you, it should be obvious that with the Dems in the state, they, uh, in, with the Dems in the state that they are, you have to start preparing now to defend yourself. 
I also just think that coincides with preparing to win. I think that that's a good thread. Zexizi has different politics than me. Um, Zexizi is much more uh, revolution focused than I am. Not, I don't think that Zexizi is like um, is like a, a, a revol like a the revolution is going to save us type guy. I just think that Zexizi uh, fixates on revolution as a more distinct event than I do. Whereas I believe that re that revolution takes the form of a, of a of like a tide you know it's not a, a it's not a single spark point um it is uh, numerous countless spark points that form only upon historical analysis into any uh purely coherent movement but i like zexizi a lot we have slightly different frameworks that we operate in also another point here Zexizi says, by all means vote, but the point is that by their nature, the Dems are geared to lose to the far right regardless of how hard you plead people to vote for them. It only goes so far. Their current performance is nothing short of incompetent, even before the debate, e.g. Gaza. I also agree with this. And another point to the, to the, uh, another coin in the little box of uh, people straw man anti-electoralists as being anti-voting when in reality, uh, they're not anti-voting. I'll be honest. Uh, Western Sentinel says, I'll be honest, I did conflate the two. Well, I don't entirely blame you, seeing as how, uh, like, most most people on the, on the like, liberal left uh, constantly do. And I don't, and, and the only reason I can articulate as to why they do that is because it's convenient for them. This is what I'm talking about, about the, posi the you know, the state of arrest that I want to change. I want to see people change their approach to this topic completely, fundamentally. I believe, um, I don't even need to say it at this point, um, 